who's our applications engineer, who will be doing all the heavy lifting and showing you how to build these basic models. And, uh, and I'm, of course, Kieran Clark, the general manager with IMGF. So we're just coming up to 11 o'clock, so we'll wait a, a few seconds and then we'll we'll get going. Um, I think that we have a lot to cover this morning, so it'll probably take the full 45 minutes. Um, at the end, during the session, you can ask any questions you have, like just by using the right, type them in using the panel in the webinar menu on the right hand side there. If you type the questions in, Amanda will then pick them up and we'll address them at the end of the presentation. Um, and then we can go from there. Okay, so will we get going? Yeah, I think we'll get started. I think we're going to have a lot to cover. So it's 11 o'clock. Okay, so good morning everybody. So the first thing is um, this year with the 2015 release of the uh, Hexagon products, um, they have released a new, with all under this new Power Portfolio Suite. So you've got the producer suite of products, the provider, and the platform. So it's really just to classify all these uh, applications into a more easy to understand uh, naming structure. And also as uh, things evolve with the move towards cloud applications and software as a service, this structure will then make a lot more sense. So the producer suite, which is what we're going to be talking about this morning, includes AirDAS Imagine, G Media, and Image Station. And this morning we're going to be talking about primarily AirDAS Imagine. So Imagine is a powerful authoring platform to allow you to turn your geospatial data into actionable information. It, it's a proven leader in remote sensing, photography, and radar and fine cloud analysis. So around the world, Imagine has been one of the leading products for remote sensing over a number of years. So just things that with, with Imagine, it provides some very simple intuitive GUIs. The ability to do powerful and dynamic modeling, and that's really what we're going to focus on this morning. Glenn is going to show a very efficient workflow to do dynamic modeling and, and create analysis without actually having to, to get involved in every part of the data around the area. And of course, it provides GIS, remote sensing, and photogrammetry, and a server product, as well as the ability to do multi-core and distributed processing. So again, if you are doing these spatial models on very large data sets, the ability to spread this load over 60 bit, 64 bit architectures or multi core machines and distributed is, is, is very necessary and is all supported. So, what is Imagine? Well, AirDAS Imagine allows you to reference your imagery to the air surface, measure primary information from the imagery to collect vector point area and other quantitative uh, data. Then you can analyze this data to draw conclusions and right, the processes and activities affecting your area of study, and again, that's primarily what we're going to focus on this morning. And then once that is done, you can update your GIS with your accurate geospatial data and present and publish this, your imagery and information in 2D and 3D environments. Uh, some of the functionalities that Imagine provides, it provides naturally a photogrammetry tool set, uh, the ability to do terrain analysis, and in the last couple of years, it, it now provides very powerful point cloud analytic tools. Again, with the 2015 release, we've enhanced the change detection workflows that are built into Imagine, and also you can do vector modeling now, so it actually uses some of the G Media components and G Media pipe tools that anyone who uses G Media would be aware of, are now built into Spatial Modeler, and you can do LiDAR modeling as well, as well as SAR in interferometry um, if you want to get in radar type data or other type of satellite information. And then you can take all that information and produce map and report, uh, reports out of it. Also you can do raster modeling, 3D seismic modeling, uh, iron clay oxide, uh, high, hyperspectral analysis, and again with all the ability to handle the point cloud data and radar data, we can do 3D analytics and you can do some advanced classification as well people have all kind of used remote sensing for. So with the 2015 release, Imagine now has a new, has enhanced the, the point cloud suite. So you've now got a interactive volumetrics in both the GUI and the spatial modeler. And now the big thing this year is the point cloud compression. So they can read the compressed point clouds direct from LAS or LAV into this hexagon point cloud compressed format. And you can also stream it via the ECWP and we can do reprojection of the point cloud on the fly. Um, a big, another big innovation this year is the MyAirDAS Imagine 
So you can create your own fully customized AirDAS Imagine and save it as your default. So you can hide all the buttons you don't want to use. And then, of course, you can also create spatial models and add them to your ribbon as well. So that makes it very easy to use and also the ability to add shortcut keys for every button. So where this will come in very useful is maybe you have a, a person who's doing uh, tax calculations or they want to just, they're doing a very specific workflow. They don't need to see the other functionality that they imagine. They just want to press three or four buttons, get the answer, get the result, and use it. This way they can be provided with a very simple, clutter-free GUI with just the menu buttons they need in the way they need to use them. So again, it makes it look more open then. It's not just a, a, a geospatial expert can use the application. It can be used by anybody in the organization. <coughs> Uh, as I said already, this year there's been a new release of the change detection solution. So again, very much driven around analyzing the changes in properties. So if you want to see where there's been new developments or where parcels have changed or where there's been on the other side illegal developments that haven't been matched, the change detection solution uses uh, two, two sets of imagery to compare and find where to detect where there's change. And that's then presented in a in a report here with the more blue lines you see, the bigger the blue line is, the more likelihood of, of change being in that area. Um, again, in Ireland, this is going to become more and more prevalent as Ordnance Survey moves to providing, and other data providers move to providing more up-to-date imagery and imagery every year. You'll be able to do this kind of analysis um, going forward. There's also now the ability to do an image chain preview. So you can preview and open your raft as an image chain in the spatial modeler, and you can simultaneously switch between the multispectral pan relief and pseudo color and thematic. So this, again, as there's been a big push, as some people may be used to using EOR Mapper. Um, EOR Mapper is, par is owned by Hexagon as well. So in Imagine now, and we're trying to the Hexagon are trying to provide more and more of the ER mapper type functionality in Imagine so that people who are used to using that part are more familiar with it. And again, this is how so this in this helps you can do real time enhancement. Um, again, the area we're going to cover this morning is Spatial Modeler and with the 2015 release there's dozens of new operators, including already as I said the image chain manipulation operators, point cloud and atmospheric correction operators. And now as you know, there's three levels of Imagine uh, Essentials, Advantage, and Professional. Professional is the one that provides spatial modeler. With Professional now, you can actually publish your models to a user who is using uh, Essentials. So they can create or edit the model, but they can run it. So all they need, you get a one power user with Professional, and then have multiple users with Essentials who can run the model and see the results. Um, again, a big thing that Ken's going to talk about later on is the enhanced analytics that's in, um, in spatial modeler. So you can use G media operators, you can do mathematical operators to perform these kind of what-if analysis and see the results. And Glenn will show you that in his demonstration. And again, as I said already, we can also now fuse point cloud and raster data to analyze the change and come up with results. So even that change detection solution that's off the shelf, you can take that information, push it through a spatial modeler, and actually add in other data sets and come up with better answers. And a big thing this year is that the spatial model and software development kit has been enhanced to make it easier for hexagon and third parties to extend Imagine into new markets and applications. So again, it, it means that like, if they, for argument's sake, some people may be looking with FME or things that may want to use some of these advanced operators in FME, you can build an interface and, and I think we'll hear more about that in the coming months. So I'm going to hand over to Glenn who's going to bring you through some of these uh, functionalities of the spatial modeler and how we can do um, an advanced analysis to, to calculate the uh, areas for development. Good afternoon everyone. Um, so this, um, this uh, webinar will demonstrate how Imagine Spatial Modeler can be used to perform analysis based on the needs of several criteria to find optimal locations for future residential development. Um, we'll use County Bidlow here as an example. All the data comes from open sources, and although the criteria evaluated if fabricated, they will be quite similar to a real-world project. Uh, this demo is designed to introduce you to some of the operators available and the capabilities of spatial.
spatial monitor. We'll get you to start thinking about using spatial monitor. The workflow incorporates sector infrastructure and topography data, along with elevation data representing a raster. This is fed into a model that utilizes the GIS capabilities of the spatial monitor within a module. The end goal here is to highlight areas for potential future residential development, and this will be achieved by assessing multiple criteria uh, to reduce the Boolean logic to map algebra. So I just have two maps here expect, uh, exported from um, Imagine. Uh, the first here shows the vector data used in the model. Uh, so we've roadways and waterways, uh, lakes, and uh, various protected and restricted land that we can't build on. Um, this is our raster DEM. This is from the Shuttle Radar Topography Mission, which is 90 meters resolution, and works perfectly for what we want to achieve here. Uh, I have a list of all the data sources. Uh, all data used here are freely and easily obtainable. Um, the data sets may not be up there comprehensive, and in some cases I've used subsets here. The main aim here is to show you the capabilities of Spatial Modeler. Uh, I'm sure your own data set will be more comprehensive. Um, so this is the project criteria. So this might be given to you from a project lead, or you might be doing the project yourself. So the, the aim here is to sort of avoid major roads and keep the uh, development closer to secondary roads, um, keep away from rivers and lakes, and avoid protection areas. Uh, we can't build above three meters above sea level uh, or on slopes greater than eight degrees, and it must be within a certain distance of uh, existing urban fabric. And we can't develop, we can only develop on certain Korean land cover, so these are mainly open spaces, pastures, grasslands, so we're avoiding forested areas and uh, all sort of um, commercial areas. I suppose if you, you could, and again, you could enhance this, like if you were using some of the other remote sense technologies, like we've had issues with development, people building on sandbanks, building on areas of shale or, you know, ga you know this uh, airborne gas or things that make the houses weak. So you could even take it on another level if you had the right data. Yeah, you can add in other, a lot of other criteria, and it's simple just to add to the model um, as needed and re-customize and rerun it as required. I think Ireland needed this about five years ago, but we'll, 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 keep, we'll, keep, we'll have it for going forward when we start all this new development. I'll open Imagine and um, I'll first show you the final model. Oh, wrong one. Here on my maker. Okay. So I'll open the final model. So we have a few FME uh, users on the call, so you can see a very similar uh, flow line and outline of the FME, so you would be very used to, used to it. So I've received models and workflows similar and more daunting this in the past for various software packages, and at first they're always a bit overwhelming. When you break it down branch by branch, it's actually um, quite simple and easy to follow. Uh, if you notice the top branch there, um, it's very similar to almost all the branches gone down, so it's an easy copy and paste down once you know the, the, the first branch. So I'll have a look at the first branch anyway and see what's going on. Um, so the first one is a, a port input, so this just will allow a pop-up to um, come up to uh, prompt us for what file we want to input, which is fed to a vector input, which is forced us to have that shape file. This is fed into a rasterized um, operator, which you see the GeoMedia um, operator. So this converts our vector to a, a raster. And we can also um, say what we want the cell size resolution to be, 100 by 100 or 50 by 50. And we can also assign uh, road values, uh, a pixel value, so they, so they uh, stand out in the raster. It's then fed into a, a search operator, which is will create a distance raster. So every pixel away from a roadway will be assigned an incre incremental uh, pixel value of one. Uh, and I'll talk about that a bit later. To, I have a, a figure to show you to make that uh, more clear. So if each pixel is only one, two, three away, we're going to multiply each pixel by 100 to give it a um, better meaning to our, our, um, our model. And this will allow us then to perform criteria that, so for the first um, criteria, it can't build within 500 meters of a road, we'll say everything less than five or even 500 meters will assign a value of zero, 
everything has to be assigned to family of one, so um, we can use so development which will be prohibited anywhere 500 metres from the road, and we can build anywhere 500 metres from the road. And I'll close down that model for now, and we'll build the first branch uh, to show you the finer details. So we first have a port input. So we'll click this and we'll rename it for primary roads. We then have a vector input. Now if I just run that, you can see it pops up um, there from the port input. We want shape files, so of course we're taking a shape file and we'll add our primary road. You can see that's reading in the data there in the model. And that green line going across the little thing, is that, that's the progress bar? Right? Progress bar, yeah. It'll be uh, it's a lot faster on a desktop. <laughs> You're <laughs> not going, getting going any in seconds. You're <laughs> not getting a new laptop. <laughs> if you can just slow up for it up. Okay, so next we want to Rasterize our input. So we double click that. We need the default cell size by 100 by 100. I'm going to use a custom recode and select all and we'll change everything to a new value of 1. So all our roads are going to be represented by a value of 1 in the raster and everything else will be a value of 0. So it'll be a temp temporary raster. So that's the temporary holding of our raster. Um, next, we will create a distance raster. So you can see the search uh, operator falls under distance. So we'll put our raster into that, and we'll change some of the parameters here. So we set the search distance to 1500. So this is going to search from each um, feature. So each row is going to search 1500 pixels. Uh, we know. Each pixel is 100 meters by 100 meters, so essentially it's searching 150 kilo, uh, kilometers. It's important that uh, now the, the features are are within this distance, that um, two roads aren't 250 kilometers apart, uh, because they'll only um, create pixels up to 150 meters. Uh, class here is our row, so we have classified them as pixel value 1. That's going to create a uh, distance raster based on our roads in our, uh, our raster, which is created from our vector. Uh, we will set the output of that into a multiply operator because each pixel is now just one, two, three, four, five away from the road. So we'll multiply the input by 100. So each each pixel will now have a value of 100, 200, 300 and so on. And then from here we can evaluate our criteria for the primary road. So we want to set everything less than or equal to 500 meters or 500 pixel value uh, to zero and everything else to a value of one where we can. So, uh, that in its preview. Okay, so we can preview that. So preview. This will step through the model. This is our preview. Okay, so these are the two. Uh, primary major roads from our uh, data set and everything colored white is areas uh, greater than 500 meters where we can build on and we can't build within the road so that's uh, 500 meters either side of the road. So you can build on white but you can't build on black? Yeah. Okay. And as we increase the criteria the white area will get smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah. yeah they do. Um, so we can So I'll just do this, the second criteria as well, and we can actually just copy and paste 
and start building a second branch. I'm going to rename it Secondary Road. Uh, we have the vector inputs. So we change. If you double click on this rasterize, we change the. Right, first I need to. For the um, vector input, we need to switch to um, a different file that we're going to read in. So that's our secondary road. Double click on raster on the property. Secondary. That's reading in our secondary rows uh, vector file. We'll keep the default cell size. We just need to, um, you can see, because it still thinks there's 36 elements in the table still, because um, we copy and paste it, so it thinks it's reading in from the, the first vector input. So you can see the new values here need to be assigned one, so we just select off, change selected. You can see they're all going to be assigned a value one now, so these are our secondary rows. Click OK. You can see now there's 1,606. Mm -hmm. Secondary road in that uh, data set. We can leave the search, that's fine. We we'll multiply again and we need to change the criteria for our secretary to match our, our secondary road. And in this case, you want the houses to be within a certain, yes. a certain distance of the road. So you want houses to be within uh, So we want to where we can't build. On anywhere greater than a thousand uh, meters, so we want to build within a kilometer of, of a of a secondary road, and we also can't build on the road itself. So that's the distance of zero, and everything else within a thousand uh, meters or kilometer will be assigned a value of one. Let's click OK. So now we can multiply those two. Criteria together. So we'll try the preview. We'll preview that. So we have our primary road or secondary road. Yeah, this is pretty lightning quick on a on a desktop. <laughs> now you can see we still can't build on black and white is our areas and it's getting smaller as uh, we add the criteria to it. Um I won't go through every branch. Um so when you're on those width though you can see the mountains starting to appear there in the middle there. Yeah. yeah. And we also have criteria there we can't build above certain types. Right. So um I just thought I won't save it, um, and I'll open one I prepared earlier. Here we have all our vector criteria. We have the two rows that we just done. We have rivers and lakes. Can't build within 200 meters. Can't build on um, protected lands. Can only build in certain distance of uh, existing urban fabric. And here I just have the Wicklow local authority boundary, so it's restricted to uh, that boundary because you might find places out to sea. Um, so now we'll just uh, we'll focus on the the raster criteria, which is our DEM. So I'll add in port input. Call it DEM. And I'll add in a raster input to open our raster. And this would be my DEM. Okay. And from here, this one can be added straight into a criteria because it's already at the elevation. So we know we can't build. 
greater than 300 meters. And everything else will be assigned a value of 1. I will add a port multiplier, feed that in. Copy and paste the first two. And from here, I'm going to feed this into a degree slope operator. So this will turn our raster into, this will calculate the slope for each uh, pixel in the DEM. And feed that into criteria. There is one thing then. I need to set the units here to meters. Is what our DEM is in, and criteria can't build on slopes greater than eight degrees. Everything else is find the value of one. We can build again. I'll add another port and a multiplier. So if I run that, which I won't do here because it'll take a few minutes, and um, I'll show you the. The output we get okay. raster. Oh, here is all our criteria mess. You can see there's a lot of scattered smaller areas. That might be a good idea for residential estates that they're going to be built on a minimum sized area. So let's say the agreed area was 600,000 square meters. Click on the metadata here. We can see the pixel sizes. So it's almost 90 meters taken from the that's taken from the DTM. Um, I usually project it to fit the Irish national grid, so that's what the pixel size might be obscure. It might have been a good idea to re uh, resample the the DM uh, to 100 pixels to match our all the rest of our rasters. Uh, so that's just food for thought. Um, but we'll, we'll run um, a clump and sieve sub model um, to remove the sort of scattered smaller areas and use the more cleaner um, development areas. Uh, I say thanks to Emily Fairster and Geo for the, the sub model. Um, it's freely available on their on their website. Uh, I'll open up the model and show you. Again, this is our final model. Here's our main chunk of our model. This is our output that I just showed you there. And this is a clump and save stove model here. So what happens is, first the clump operator identifies contiguous groups of pixels. And then the sieve uh, removes the clump smaller than a user-defined size. So uh, we know we want it to be greater than 600,000 square meters. We know each pit is around 90 meters by 90 meters. Um, so that's uh, 81,000 square meters. If you divide 600,000 by that, you get 74. So we want groups of pixels of 74 pixels are, are, uh, are more. So if I ran that model, you can see our list of inputs are required. We can see here, you can set here to end how many pixels, so we want it to be 74. Uh, I'll show you the output from that. So you can see it's cleaned up the smaller areas and it's really uh, highlighted the larger areas where uh, that, that match our, our criteria for the 600,000 square meters as a minimum for, for development. Uh, so it's, it's fairly stark when you, when you think of the county of Wicklow. Yeah. That, that's all the areas that are actually suitable. And uh, okay, the, the criteria you know we could change or we're not saying it's the, the exact correct, exactly correct criteria, but it's not far off. No. Well, I was just going to say there that the multi-criteria <laughs> analysis is a it's often an interesting process where you might want to relax or strengthen some of the criteria. Uh, sometimes. 
when you run the criteria, you'll find there are no areas that so you need to relax them, or you'll find it's too much, so you tighten some of them, yeah, find, yeah. find the optimum areas. And that's where the spatial matter is good, you can just go in, change the criteria, and run it again. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 but also, as in a lot of county councils, their development plan would change every five years. Yeah. So, or there would be sub uh, rules, you know, there's, there's usually like two or three amendments during the five years, so they'll tweak things. And yeah, you, you'd have different, and or you might have it in a, an urban area, slightly different rules than in a rural area, so you can tweak the, you know, for a town boundary or whatever, but God, when, you, when you look at it like that, it's really automated, and anybody then, you know, you could publish that map out for pre-planning or whatever, and people could look at it and say, well, if you're not in these areas, you're not going to build a housing estate, and if you're outside these areas, you're going to have a challenge, and you're going to need local needs and all that other rules for building small houses. Okay, pretty good. So, so we can display the attribute table here and we can change the opacity of the black so it's transparent and we make these red. We can then, yeah, we'll save the colours. We can add a base map in of open street maps. To add it to the window. So you can see now all the different areas. Yeah. Quite interesting that you have our club down here, it's a large enough town, and there's no nowhere around us for that is our criteria. Yeah. Could be a good yeah. <laughs> or it could be lack of data. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, it is only sampled open data, so it's, it's got a definite help warning on it. Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day, NGIS are a remote sensing project output is only as good as the data that's fed in. So again, your data might be a lot more comprehensive than what I have, and you'll you'll get a different output. Anyway, we'll, we'll roll what we have now, and uh, we'll generate a report style figure to PDF or JPEG using a, a map window and the map composer. Just going to open the session I've saved previous. Here I just have all the data from the map I showed you previously. Okay, so I'll we'll change the opacity here. Change the color. So we can see them. And I will open a new map window. I change the page size A4. Still the same. Um, first of all, I'll add in a header. And we can change these. Change the white, black, the line cut up two. Copy and paste that and put it down the bottom. Uh, there's nice arranged tools here, uh, similar to a graphic design package where you can line up all your elements. So I'll write in there. And you can add in text. So choose text, so I'll say I want to be 24 point bold. That's that, so click low residential. And then center that, and you can use your arrow keys also to move around elements. And we can add the map, add the map frame. So this asks you to, I've only ever used the viewer here to import the data. This is the bounding box of this data, of this frame here. 
uh, is the scale, which I was before, so you know, 300,000 is a nice scale. If I click back in here, you can see it's shrunk the size of the box. My center is starting to move slightly to the right there, so I can put a legend up in here. Click OK. I wanted to uh, can add a legend in here. This legend uh, tool needs is uh, there's a there's a change request in for this legend because when you add it in, it only ever adds in the top um, feature at a time. So I asked them uh, about the other day, and they put a change request in that when you use this legend, it'll populate with all the um, with all the layers. Uh, at the moment, I found the best way was to do was to actually just draw a little box and write the text in beside it and do the same for line. Um, a bit cumbersome but it, it, it looks nice in the end. Um, well, it's a one. And once you've done it you can save it as a template. Yeah. Uh, so I'll just show you now. I have I close down this one. I'll save it. And I'll open a new app window. I'll just right click and open map composition. So I have a webinar demo here already done. Yeah. Let's see. I'll meet these items. I'll put them back in. Maybe they won't. <laughs> <laughs> They have um go back up. We have a scale bar here we can we can enter. You just choose the point where you want it to go and it'll ask you what map frame you want to associate it with. So there's our map frame. Um we'll add in the representative fraction which is the three hundred thousand to one. Uh we'll use kilometers and I only want this to be maximum of five centimeters on the page. So I'll apply that. You can see it puts it in. So it's quick and easy. You can click on this and you can change the colour of it if you want. You can increase the font size, so I'll do that slightly. That's our scale bar. And then we can add in a north arrow. So I'll change the font north arrow. And I like this one here. Black arrow, click OK. I'll add it in. Place that where I want it to be. I've added in text there for the author, the date, and the version. I said version. <laughs> there's our um, our legend. That's actually if I, I can delete out the. I can see it doesn't have the um, our errors. Let's take everything from the map viewer and put it into our, our view on the map. So there's our, our areas. We can add that into a legend. I'll do it now. Uh, so we can either export to a geo PDF. We can send it to a JPEG. Um, these, uh, these can also be exported to um, a shape file if you want to use another GIS. Uh, for now, we can also print. So if we print to Geo PDF. Oh. Uh, save it. I'll write that one. It's important I press this rasterize before print. Or, um, it won't uh, rasterize that into the PDF. It seems to uh, shoot everything up to the top and make just wick look come out was all green. Mm -hmm. so click OK and let that run. So 
And you also have that, you, you could have sent that report to PowerPoint or Word so people could yeah. it off and stick in something else, which is pretty cool as well. section of the county or do it manually or run queries, you can build it, run across a whole heap of data and get an answer. If you need to tweak it, you can tweak it, change the rules, run the model, feed the answer and feed into a report and provide that management report. So I think that's a, a very powerful workflow that could be very easily extended to meet whatever um, requirements you have. Uh, um, so let me just get on to our last couple of slides. So just coming up webinars, so we had our spatial analysis model, model <laughs> webinar today. We have GMA webinar 2015 on the 21st of April, and I think registration is open for that now. Um, also, you have our GMA 2015, location publisher, smart client, and a, a lot more other webinars are up on the webinars page, and the link is there. You can follow us on LinkedIn and on Twitter at IMGS underscore Ireland. Um, we have our usual events this year, so our user conference IMGS 2015 is on on the 26th of May. Um, FME World Tour is going to be in Dublin on the 29th of June and in Belfast on the 30th. And then we'll be delving more deeper into these kind of hexagon geospatial solutions on the 22nd and 24th of September. So you'll see more on Imagine and Spatial Modeler. You'll also see on all the rest the hexagon solutions such as G Media. Web map, smart land, and a problem. So I think we've just about time for a few questions. So Amanda, any questions? Great, yeah, one came in there about Glenn's workflow. Could you publish it, the workflow to the web? Um yeah, you could. Uh, there's I just mentioned the part there. You've got um uh Airdaf Apollo, which is in essence is a web server version of Imagine, so any spatial models that are created in, in Imagine on the desktop can be easily published out to Apollo and then shared via a, a website and then you could even have that finished map coming through down as a, as a, on a web browser using the Apollo uh, Geospatial Portal client. So these models could be done by one person and shared around and published either on the web or on the cloud as well. I think there's going to be some nice things coming through the cloud in the next few months as well. Any other questions? No. Okay, well, thanks again, everybody, for uh, coming today. Thanks again for doing the demo. It was really interesting, very good. And for Amanda for arranging everything, even though she didn't put her picture up on the opening slide, but doesn't mind putting our pictures up. Um, so hopefully you can come to our next webinar next month on G Media Web Map, and hope you have a good day. Thanks, everybody.